but I've got three talks today, so it's going to happen. It's okay. I'm going to put this up here for, uh, for anyone that wants to grab the slides. Um, there's going to be a ton of code in here, and due to our time restriction, I'll be going through it kind of quickly. Uh, all the code came out of this Python presentation that's in an IPython notebook. And um, you can download it, and if you, have, if you set up a virtual environment and install the requirements, you can actually look at all the code and execute it right in the notebook. Uh, it's a really convenient, easy way to learn. There's actually three sections. There's one that's just a CQL timer. It shows you all the things that you can do with it. There's another one that's uh, uh, the Python data driver, which I'm going to be talking about. And then there's the third one, uh, which is uh, it's called CQL Engine. It's the object mapper for Cassandra, which uh, was written by a coworker and myself. Um, so we'll be talking about that. And then the slides themselves I've already uploaded to SlideShare. So if you want these exact slides, if you want to follow along, um, absolutely download it. It will uh, make me look awesome because I just posted them today, and there'll be like hundreds of downloads, and that's really exciting. Um, all right, so I'm going to get started. Uh, as we talked about with Cassandra, um, this is going to be a really boring talk. Talking to your database with a driver should not be exciting. If it is, then there's something very wrong happening. There shouldn't be any, like, oh my god, like I finally get it moments, because if there is, then whoever wrote the driver uh, absolutely has failed as a developer. Um, there should never be confusing. So what are we going to talk about today? I'm going to go over basic driver concepts, how to connect, how to form queries, talk about the object mapper that I love so much that I wrote. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about how you can integrate this uh, with your application. So we have our native Python driver. One of the things that we've done at DataStacks is uh, we've written drivers for, I think, like six or seven different languages. There's C++, Python, uh, Java, whatever. I'm going to talk about the Python one. Uh, it handles a whole bunch of things for you. It automatically discovers your cluster topology. It uh, does connection tooling for you. It will multiplex queries over a single connection so you don't have tons of sockets being opened up. It does load balancing, and in the next release, it's going to finally include SQL Engine, uh, which has been a de facto mapper for about two years now. Uh, and like a lot of other things that we do, it's fully open source under the Apache license. So uh, there's no boogeyman you know, there. It's, it's you do whatever you want with it, it's all yours. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to connect uh, to Cassandra. And to do that, we have to import uh, the cluster, create a cluster instance. You're going to pass a list of hosts. This doesn't have to be every machine. In this case, I'm only talking to local hosts, so I only have the one. If you had a 500 node cluster, you could pass three IP addresses or three host names, and it's totally fine. It will discover the entire topology automatically. It will discover uh, if there's remote data centers automatically. There's a lot of other things that you can pass uh, along to this. You can include Things like a custom load balancing policy, uh, reconnect policy, retry policy, and so in case a query fails, it will automatically retry for you. And um, once you've connected, as the line down here has, uh, you pick a key space, and you end up with this thing called a session. A session is what you interact with to perform queries. Uh, when you execute queries, as we talked about, we're going to use CQL. The most basic stuff, that, the most basic thing that we can do with session.execute is to pass a string. Uh, this is fine for things like creating tables, uh, but unfortunately it doesn't, uh, it's not shown anywhere, so it won't automatically go to the correct server for a particular query. So we showed you uh, in a previous uh, talk about how whenever you do a read or write, uh, if we know the partition key, we actually know which server we can talk to. So it's an optimization. For uh, creating tables, it doesn't matter which server you talk to because they all need to be aware of your schema changes. So it's fine to do it this way. Now, prepared statements. Uh, if you've been working in the relational world, you probably uh, take a look at prepared statements. Anytime you do a select, uh, insert, uh, update, your delete, you're going to want to use it. I forgot selecting that. Uh, you're going to want to use it for anything where you're dealing with data. Uh, it decreases server load by uh, keeping um, the in memory representation of what that query is supposed to do. Uh, it gives you increased security, and it's going to give you token aware queries. So, we can take a look um, on this uh, example that I have over here. We're, we're doing a uh, prepare of an insert statement. You can see there's placeholders over there that are question marks. And then you can execute, and you pass a tuple, and in this case, we're passing a new ID and a string. And here, we're, we're uh, executing 
uh, synchronously, um, we're inserting a bunch of photos, we're putting 100 photos in the system. And synchronous is cool, uh, except it's slow and actually not that cool. Um, so the way that we deal with getting better performance, especially when we have a system where you know, our data is spread across, let's say, dozens of machines, uh, we want to be able to do things asynchronously to take advantage of all the machines in the cluster. So what we do is we use prepared statements, and the driver's going to help us out of it. So we want to just use everything. The, uh, the first option that we have is asynchronous queries and callbacks. You prepare a statement uh, right over here. You have a callback function that you're going to use. Um, and then you call execute async. When you execute async, it returns the future. The future, uh, you can then add a callback to it. And as soon as the query is done executing, your callback will uh, be called with the response and with any of the additional oops, with any additional information provided uh, to add callback quarks. Uh, so anything that you pass will come back. <coughs> An easier way to manage all this is you can use uh, there's a Cassandra.concurrent library, and you can just pass a list of tuples or a list of lists, and you have we prepare our statement, and then we have execute concurrent with ours. You effectively pass your session to it, your prepared select statement, or insert statement, or whatever it is, and then a list of lists, and it will execute that prepared statement with each of those lists within that bigger list. Uh, so if you could have 100,000 things in here, and it will also do throttling for you, so you may not want to, let's say, rate a CSV and do um, a billion simultaneous queries to your cluster, it can uh, roll them out um, incrementally for you. Uh, so performance considerations. My god, I'm killing it on time. I hope I'm not going too fast. <laughs> so, uh, like SQL, SQL features the in statement, and it also has this concept of batching. People that see this are very, very tempted to use it because they come from a relational world, and you say, you know what, uh, when I do an insert, I want to insert 100 things at once because there's a transaction overhead. Uh, they try and apply that same model to Cassandra, where they read a bunch of data and they go, you know what, I see this in thing, I know I need these 100 uh, items, I want to get them out of Cassandra. It's an anti pattern, it will perform horribly. Uh, you will end up with, well, you'll have to talk to this guy, and this guy will talk to everybody else. And the problem here is that the coordinator is going to have to wait on responses from all the other servers. If any of them fail, then your query will fail, and you'll have to retry the whole thing. So it's terrible. Don't ever do this. Uh, the nice thing is that there are Fortune 500 companies that continue to make this mistake today. You guys will want me doing this. I'm really excited about that. So let me talk a little bit about the object now. Everything okay so far? Oh, yes? I, I was wondering why would it have to talk to all the servers if all the data is replicated on one server? Because all the data is not replicated on one server. There is, it's highly unlikely that all your data would be on one server. If you did a select all from users, select star from users, ID in, and you passed 100 IDs, it's probably going to be on a significant number of servers. So the performance is terrible. And you actually also incur a lot of GC overhead. Garbage budget. The worst. Like, everyone tries to do it, everyone fails. I'm going to keep going because it's almost lunchtime and I'm going to be yelled at by everybody here. Um, so I'm going to talk about, a little bit about CQL Engine. It's a way that we can define uh, our tables programmatically within Python. We can query them. It makes it really, really easy uh, for us to work with our data. So um, everything's going to inherit from CQL Engine, Cassandra.cqlengine.com. And uh, you can even define collections in there. I'm going to show you an example of that. Uh, you can do table management. So over here, we have something called sync table. And whenever you have a model, if you sync that table, it will, uh, if it doesn't exist, it will create it. If it does exist, it will apply any alters necessary to add the fields that you need to make it match uh, your schema definition. Um, the only thing it won't do is it won't change the types of your tables because it's a destructive action, and it won't, it won't drop any columns because that would be ridiculous, and I knew I would screw up my own database, so I didn't do that. Um, I figured I'd break it. Um, Models with collections, very, very useful. It's really easy to uh, design things. Like here we have a, a messages, and we have a set of UUIDs. Maybe that's a list of user IDs. Uh, or we have photo, and we have a, let's say, likes at the bottom, which is a UUID. 
and text. And maybe that's my user ID and my name. So I can just show who likes this. Very uh, easy to get out. I have a list of photos and a single query. I have a photo and everyone's uh, user ID and name that like it. Uh, we have cluster keys that we took a look at in previous slide that determines the ordering of data within a partition. And uh, we have, in this example, we have our users in group. And if you define multiple uh, fields as your primary key, uh, if the, the first name will become the partition key and the subsequent items will become the cluster keys in the order that they're specified in the model. Uh, you also have this guy. Um, where we have, if we wanted to have multiple keys be participants in the partition key, which we didn't really talk about in the slide, but it is possible you can do it uh, if I want to have like a lookup of users in a group by state. Like if I have a general worldwide Cassandra user thing, but I want to know, you know, who's in wherever, uh, I can look it up. And that's efficient. Um, all right. So we're going to talk a little bit about this, uh, inserting and selecting data. Uh, if you want to insert, we have model, uh, user model that create. Uh, I don't know if this code is too small for people in the back to read. I'm sorry, that's why I posted the slide. I'm hoping everyone will download it. Um, model can perform validation. Uh, you can do custom validation. So if you want to say uh, something like there's no John allowed in this table, uh, you can do that and it will throw an exception. Um, I haven't talked, we didn't talk about TTLs in the previous slide, but you can TTL your data. And uh, it won't um, delete it when the 60 seconds there is up, but it will stop uh, being a thing. And when compaction occurs, it will be removed. So uh, the, the TTL is written with your data. Um, this is really nice if you want to have like uh, an analytic system that takes in a bunch of raw data, aggregates it, and then after seven days, you don't need that raw data anymore because you're ingesting like 100 billion seconds uh, <coughs> a day. It just depends on the back of the people who are uh, Lightweight transactions. Uh, we talked a little bit about this. This is supported in the, uh, in the object mapper. You can do user if not exists.create. This will do uh, Paxos for us, and it just does all the magic under the covers, and you end up uh, with a very safe system for creating users. You can need to update using Paxos. You can as well. Uh, similar, you can just provide quarts of the uh, values that you need to satisfy a requirement, and we'll go ahead and update. So the statement at the bottom would be uh, update, what is it, update user, um, set age equals 101, uh, where name equals John, um, if age equals 100. So you get a, a nice uh, isolated uh, transaction. <coughs> All right, uh, I didn't talk really about batches on the previous talk, but there is a notion of batching statements together. This is really only useful if you are, let's say, keeping multiple materialized views up to date. Uh, the batch will, if you use a, what's called a log batch, it will make sure that all of the mutations that you, you have, so if you have like 10 updates and five inserts, they'll all occur. So they, it, the, it gets logged onto multiple servers, and there's checks to ensure that all these things happen. So if you've got like 10 materialized views and you want to make sure they're kept, all kept up to date and you're nervous about network outages or machine failures and, and the data being inconsistent, this is what you want to use. Um, and then you can see down here you just uh, set up a batch query uh, context and you use it when you call user.create and make sure you pass your batch to it and everything will be okay. Um, Obviously, this is totally useless if you can't fetch data out of it. So what we have here is, uh, for getting a single row, we have model.get. Uh, it will return a single row if the row does not exist. It will confusingly throw a does not exist exception. I was kidding, but the confusing thing is obvious. Um, so here we go, user.get brings back my user, very sweet. Uh, we can fetch multiple rows by, let's say we create all those things over here. And uh, here we got automobile uh, objects uh, that you pass as cards, um, a list of filters, and it will construct the statement and the grid. Uh, you can also manage your table properties with this. So we talked a little bit about having things like level compaction. Um, actually, I haven't really talked about level compaction, but it's a different compaction strategy optimized for solid state drives. 
Uh, there's another one called Date to Year Compaction Optimized for uh, Time Series Data for TTLs. Um, and you can put any of these on here when you sync the table. It will take a look at the uh, table options as it's set up in the database and go ahead and resolve any conflicts and fix your table for you. We have, oh, this is good. Um, we have table inheritance. If you want to have multiple tables that you uh, only manage off of base single table, let's say you had um, ads, I worked on an ad system, and we had a single base ad and we had like 20 different subtypes of those ads, and they all had similar fields, uh, we use something like this. This is really useful if the queries that you want to do are always, I want a very specific ad type and I want to select that data. It's not as useful if you want to say, give me all of the ads, um, let's say, give me a, a heterogeneous list of ads that fall under the ad campaign, um, but they can be different ad types. That is where you would want to use table polymorphism. So what this does is it allows you to create multiple database models that are all stored in a single table and you can query, um, you can do one query, and you can get a list of a bunch of different types of that. So these tools are pretty flexible. They allow you to do multiple different query patterns, and um, it's pretty efficient for selecting that data as well. So your options for application development. One thing I want everybody to be aware of, if you're not already using virtual environments uh, to manage your Python code, virtual env is the best tool ever. It's, uh, it's built into Python. 3.4, but if you're still using Python 2.7, like pretty much most of the world is, uh, you're going to have to download this manually. This is the only thing that you should install. It should be pip, virtual m, and make virtual m, and other than that, nothing should touch your system Python. You should always be using virtual m because you can create these isolated sandboxes with their own versions of code. This is one of the most important things I learned um, early on about really practical Python development. If you don't do this, then you can only have one version uh, of your packages um, for your entire system. So you can't work on multiple projects. As far as integrating with third-party projects, there is a library for Django. Uh, there's, uh, it's reasonably easy to integrate with Blast. You just have to use the app dot before first request, set up your connection. Um, there's currently a an issue with the way certain uh, frameworks and certain, um, like UWS GI handles forking. Effectively, if you create a, if you create an instance of a Cassandra connection and you then fork that process, uh, you'll have two applications where you're trying to use the same socket, and one of them will fail miserably. You don't want to do that. Um, so basically, if you have an issue where you're like, I don't understand why this thing is failing, just remember, oh, I need to look into forking. And guess what? I have just done a 40 minute presentation in 17 minutes. <laughs> Boom. Thank you. It was cool. Uh, are there any questions? Or are you guys at lunch, probably, right? And you can just grab me for questions? Or what? No one was hungry? Raise your hand if you're hungry. Okay, that's enough. Let's break. <laughs> Grab me if you want questions answered. I'm happy to help out and sit down and talk. Questions.